July 2016. The world was united under one common goal. Do you remember where you were when Pokemon Go was released in your country? Just in case you missed it, Pokemon Go is an augmented reality mobile game where players' real-world location could lead to a chance encounter with a virtual Pokemon, to which then the player would attempt to catch said pocket monster. With Pokemon Go, our world became the Pokemon world. Pokemon tended to appear in places with more significant landmarks, so a few of my friends and I decided to drive over to Washington, D.C., where there were plenty of monuments and museums. We thought we were really clever, but then when we got there, we weren't the only ones that had the same idea. It was a really hot summer Sunday, and especially humid for DC weather. But that didn't stop the crowds of people crammed shoulder to shoulder on the sidewalks and the streets, noses in their phones to see past the glare of the sun and swirling their index fingers for the chance to throw a spin ball and capture whatever Pokemon was on their screen. It was amazing. People would scream out their favorite Pokemon name when it appeared, and everyone in the crowd would stampede towards it. For one weekend, everyone in our nation's capital was a Pokemon trainer. And then, just as it arrived, I suddenly lost track of that camaraderie. The very next Monday, I was back at work, full tie and suit, running around in my office, surrounded by similarly dressed consultants. I looked for a chance to share the craziness that I encountered just the day before, but I didn't run into anyone that would share my same enthusiasm. Instead, I kept my head down and spent the day creating PowerPoints and sending hundreds of emails with my favorite greeting, which starts, per my last message. I traveled weekly for work back then. So that evening, I found myself lying in an unfamiliar hotel bed, staring at the unfamiliar hotel ceiling with a look even Shinji Ikari of Evangelion would be impressed with. I wondered what happened to all those people that stormed DC with me just the day before. Did they go into hiding as well? Unable to sleep, I grabbed my phone and started watching videos in an attempt to help me get to sleep. As one usually does when they start such an activity, I ended up down the YouTube rabbit hole. And it was then when I stumbled upon a corner of the internet I didn't notice before. A group of people that very publicly gathered and very publicly played Pokemon. And not only were they catching them all, they were catching them all fast. I ran into what was known as Pokemon speed running. See, the, the trick is if you don't go to college parties, you can get pretty good times in Pokemon speed runs. That's Jacob. I go by shenanigans online. There's an underscore at the end and it's spelled wrong. Jacob shenanigans underscore is a speed runner who usually likes to compete in a category called catch em all using Pokemon Blue. He's a full-time streamer that makes an income by catching Pokemon over and over again. In my eyes, that makes him a bona fide, real-life, actual Pokemon master. I ran into Jacob when I first started wondering if I should jump into the speedrunning world. In my search to find a pocket of the gaming world that I could professionally claim for myself, I thought that revisiting one of my favorite franchises might be a good place to start. When I first played Pokemon Red as a grade schooler, catching 151 Pokemon was a year-long endeavor. But for speedrunners like Jacob, they can catch them all much faster. When I started Catch Em All, my first run was nine hours. Wow. The world record at the time was seven and a half hours. So how close to that world record did Jacob get? And if I wanted to be a Pokemon speedrunning master and be as open about it as he was, what did it take to get there? 
I spent some time with Jacob to find out. And to my surprise, I caught a glimpse of something much bigger. This is Life in Games, the stories of people who have found their own homes in gaming. I'm your host, Andy Reinhold. Jacob grew up in a home where games were a part of normal conversation. My parents have always been like in with gaming and whatnot. They like to brag about how good they were at uh, Super Mario Bros. 3. They beat the game, apparently. I don't know how long it took them, but they claim they have beaten the game and they always brag about it. They're definitely gamers. <laughs> I do have a picture floating around somewhere of when my parents got me my Game Boy for my birthday and I got Pokemon Red with it. So Pokemon came out in 98, so I was five. Definitely excited, definitely played a lot of it. I know for a fact I picked Blastoise. I must have been a smart kid. And then I think I remember having a Jolteon. And I was a big Beedrill fan. So maybe I wasn't a smart kid. <laughs> when you start off on your Pokemon journey, you are not allowed to have your Game Boy and your Pokemon companions leave your side. It's pretty much a written law and enforced by social services. My sister's like really into dance and as a kid I'd have to just sit there and be at the practice. Every week I would go to this dance place and just sit there and play Pokemon in the corner. And I met another kid there and he was a little bit older, like two years older. And he had Pokemon Blue and we would do Link battles. And he would trash me every week because he knew about Cinnabar Island glitch and he had a level 240 Snorlax and would just destroy me every single time and I couldn't do anything about it. If you were a part of the red, blue, green generation, you might remember this glitch. It's the glitch that allows you to duplicate items. Most people use it to cheat the game and create a lot of rare candies, an item used to level up your Pokemon and instantly make them stronger. But depending on a few variables, sometimes really powerful Pokemon would show up, like that level 240 Snorlax Jacob mentioned, and sometimes you would run into a Pokemon legend. Missing though. So I I found out how to do like the Cinnabar Island glitch thing and get the higher level Pokemon. And because my name was Jacob and your name is what determines what Pokemon that you get from the Cinnabar Island glitch, capital A gives you a missing no, which I captured. B also gives you missing no. And because there's a blank character after it, because Jacob has two blank characters for the, the letters like six and seven, it was level zero missing now. And if you withdraw a level zero missing no from the PC, it corrupts your save file. So in my quest to counter my blatantly cheating friend, I corrupted my save data as like an eight year old kid and I was heartbroken. I had to start a new game and play all the way up. That new game took Jacob two months to get back where he needed to be. And by the time he got there, his friend moved on from that game. There never was a rematch. Jacob got older and found new games to play that demanded his attention. And soon, he learned about the world of speedrunning and found out that he could play his favorite games much faster than before. As the name implies, Speedrunning involves playing a game as fast as possible. Oftentimes, you would find a speedrunner starting a timer when the game starts and stop the timer when the final boss or objective is complete. Simple enough, right? Games can be run in different categories, conditions that need to be met while you're running. For example, in Super Mario 64, there are 120 stars to collect in the game, so, there's a category called 120 star, where you have to collect all 120 stars before beating the game. Records for this seem to hover around 1 hour and 40 minutes. You could also beat the game without collecting any stars. 
this category is called Zero Star, and records for this hover around 7 minutes. The category you play determines which strategies and skills you'll need to deploy. Many games have speedrunners dedicated to them. Games like Portal, Donkey Kong Country, Minecraft. When Jacob found out about speedrunning, he started practicing with Halo and Call of Duty. I was like early high school, probably like freshman, sophomore. My account name was Pure Snipes X because that was my Call of Duty Xbox Live tag. Jacob told me that one day he got really upset during a playthrough of Call of Duty. And while his parents were usually supportive of his gameplay, they weren't too thrilled about whatever it was Jacob did to express his anger. So they threw down the ban hammer. Jacob wasn't allowed to play Call of Duty for a month. But while he was staring at his Call of Duty-less screen, he ran into an old friend. I had seen Worcester did a speedrun for Games Done Quick that year. And it was Pokemon Gold. So that was the first speedrun I had seen. And then I looked up like Pokemon speedruns and found... Supermain was one runner and Worcester was the other, and the two of them were competing pretty hardcore for the gold record. And I had played a lot of Pokemon Gold. That's probably the Pokemon game I remember the most as a kid was Pokemon Gold and Silver. So I was like, oh, I'll jump in on that. I'm good at Pokemon. So I just started doing Pokemon Gold and Silver speedruns. And I remember my first streams, I had the game, obviously. So I just plugged it into my Game Boy, turned it on, turned my laptop around, pointed it down, put my arms around my laptop with my SP, grabbed my rock band microphone, because I didn't have a built-in microphone on my laptop, duct taped that to my bed frame, and laid, laid back in my bed, and that's how I was playing Pokemon for my first stream. Kind of a janky setup, not optimal, obviously. When you speed run Pokemon, there's a lot of precise button pressing and decisions you need to make. Like walking around the world in a very particular set pattern to maximize your time and reduce random encounters. Or catching very specific Pokemon for very specific stats to take advantage of the game's quirks. For Jacob, as soon as the game started, he set the in-game clock to Sunday, no daylight savings time, and picked Totodial the water starter. He'd also have to specifically remove the berry, an item that his new Pokemon companion carried with him. Later, there were even more specific steps Jacob takes, like talk to Kurt at his house and do not step inside the center. Go shopping and buy one potion, two super potions, and three repel items. By the way, don't forget to grab the hidden full heal item that's behind this well. But no matter how careful Jacob was, he was finding that his runs were less than fast. I remember like my first run, I was like, how the heck am I an hour behind? So I was like, how does, how do these people getting the record always get these crucial knockouts when I can't? And then I finally learned because that's kind of when I started like watching streams as well. More was when I started streaming and I was like, why did it keep starting over at the beginning? And I realized very quickly it was because I didn't reset for Totodile stats. Part of speedrunning Pokemon, uh, you need a good Pokemon, obviously. So what you would do is you would start a new game, play up to where you pick the starter, pick your starter, look at the stats, and if they weren't really good, you would start over and then just keep doing that until finally, oh, there's a good one, and you would get to play the game. So my, my first runs were with just these garbage Toda dials and I would keep dying to just random stuff because I just didn't have good enough stats. I was like, oh, this makes way too much sense. <laughs> I finally get it now. Jacob had to look towards the other runners in the community to get some ideas. And once he got them, Jacob started getting into a rhythm that gets ingrained into him and becomes his guiding principle. I was definitely pretty happy with my like early on times. Once I started setting goals, because like a big part of speedrunning is about like setting personal goals. So for me, my first personal goal was under four hours. And I met that and I was like really happy. I was like, yes, I got a 357 or whatever my time was. And then I was like, all right, my next goal is going to be 345. And then you get that. It's like, yes, that's another goal that I've accomplished for like my speedrun times. Jacob kept running and continued beating his own times. 
And eventually, people caught on to him on Twitch. Random people started joining his chat and asking Jacob what he was doing, why he was taking particular steps. And slowly, Jacob was starting to build a community around him. They would show up to laugh with Jacob if he messed something up and to cheer him on when he beat his times. College was on the horizon. Jacob went to university and decided to start off studying accounting. And if accounting was anything like my experience, gaming was going to take a back seat. And this is where I bring back my old friend, Andrew B. Reinhold, PMP, Project Management Professional. See, before Andrew B. Reinhold, PMP was Andrew B. Reinhold, PMP, he was Andrew B. Reinhold, accounting major. A wild Andrew B. Reinhold of the accounting major variety was often spotted at 2 a.m. in the library. Like clockwork, he would start his nightly ritual by banging his fist into his book after failing to answer a question correctly for the past six hours. If you watch closely, you'll catch a glimpse of Andrew B. Reinhold accounting major's signature move, slam, on both the accounting book and the double doors out the library. Follow Andrew B. Reinhold accounting major back to his college apartment and you'd see him greet his drunk partying roommates with his ceremonious sneer of jealousy. After storming up the stairs into his room, Andrew B. Reinhold accounting major finally relinquishes his hold on his accounting book as he throws it into the corner and jumps face first into bed, thus completing tonight's ritual, only to repeat the process all over again the very next day. I could only imagine what Jacob had to go through. Uh, I didn't study like as much as I should, obviously, in college because I had to get I had to beat my times. Like, how, how else am I going to do it? I have four hours. I'm not going to study accounting, which is my major. I'm going to I'm going to get a good time and Pokemon catch them all. See, the, the trick is, if you don't go to college parties, you can get pretty good times in Pokemon speedruns. That that's what I learned in college. So there'd be parties in my dorm room and I I'd just be playing Pokemon on my bed or whatever. I was very invested in Pokemon speedruns. That was what I like enjoyed to any any downtime at all that I had. I was grinding. Usually the catch them all record was usually what I was going for. Catch them all, the category Jacob has started running in, is the category where you catch all 151 Pokemon available in Pokemon Blue as quickly as possible. You're allowed to exploit the game's glitches to speed up the process. Time ends when you reach the normal final destination, the Pokemon Hall of Fame, and your Pokemon are fully registered into it. I worked like 20 hours a week at a, in the dining hall, and then I also had my stream. I was streaming literally any opportunity. The, the speed run was about three hours long. If I had a three hour gap, I would do attempts. What's nice about catch them all is you can just start any run. You don't have to reset for the stats. So I could just take any start and just go. So I would literally just play the run until it died. And then I would just go to class or something. I remember one time I was like too aggressively trying to do a run. And I literally was finishing the run, walking to class. I was walking to class, streaming a run. The whole campus had Wi-Fi. I was just on like the college Wi-Fi. I had my laptop held like this. Jacob has his laptop on his left arm, holding it like an infant baby, while his right hand is pressing the keys. I was playing like one-handed, walking to class, playing Pokemon. I didn't have a webcam back then, but I just used like my microphone. So I was talking to myself with the laptop, walking to class. Oh man, uh, I got. I have to do the menu here and this is like two X attacks on this fight or like something like that. I was probably just talking to myself, just like I always do. I probably look like such a dweeb. Like, <laughs> this, this dude just playing Pokemon Red and Blue, walking to class. I was still streaming too. Yeah, I was literally just, if I had time to do a run, I would budget in that time, immediately do it. What do you think it is about speedrunning that just keeps you coming back to it? I feel like it's mostly the community. Like a lot of us are like good friends. A lot of us like compete with each other. 
kind of relates to sports in a way, maybe. A lot of the people who you're speedrunning with, they're kind of like teammates and opponents in a way, because you're coming up with strategies and all of us are really helping each other out. Because like I'll be watching a stream and someone will do a different strat than I use. It's like, oh, that's really cool. Or so we're like teammates in a way. But then at the same time, there's the, the leaderboard aspect where I'm going for first place. They're going for first place. Like we're rivals in that sense. So it's definitely a really cool community. At the end of the day, like we're all friends. It, no, it's not like we all hate each other. Like, oh, he got my record. I got it beat him now. We're usually like really happy when someone beats our time, especially because most of us are competing with ourselves anyway. As Jacob explains this to me, I'm reminded of the experience I had back in DC when Pokemon Go first came out. It was my first real world encounter with part of this community that made an impact on me. The community I didn't realize was there, but was ever present. One thing that stands out to me is that Jacob and the other speedrunners often raid other people's channels on Twitch. Raiding is an activity that happens when a streamer sends all of their viewers from their own channel to another streamer's channel. It's a common way for streamers to connect their communities together. Jacob often raids other people's channels and gets raided himself. So as Jacob gets faster at catch em all, his community grows as well. As Jacob completes his undergrad, he decided to drop accounting and pursue a degree in education so that he could be a teacher or a professor afterwards. It was here where I couldn't help but put myself in Jacob's shoes again. I remember the anxiety that filled me as graduation loomed nearer. Upon crossing the threshold that takes you from undergrad to graduated, there's an unsurmountable pressure to make sure you get a return on your college tuition. The cost of going to college is to get a job. And a job means that you probably can't be speedrunning all day long anymore. But Jacob also had something much bigger on his mind. Maybe something that imposed an even larger amount of pressure on him. Up until now, Jacob was laser focused on beating his own times and seeing how far he could go. But at this point, he still hadn't accomplished one particular goal. He hadn't gotten a world record. When I started Catch Em All, my first run was nine hours. The world record at the time was seven and a half hours. Jacob was already a great runner. Once he put his mind to beating the current seven plus hour record, it didn't take him long to actually beat it. When he told me about it, he told me he achieved the record pretty nonchalantly. The first time I took the world record, I got a four hour, 19 minute run. That was my first record in Pokemon was the catch em all record. It was four hours, 19 minutes. But Jacob being Jacob wasn't happy with just beating the world record time. Jacob did what Jacob does best. There was this big meme, it was like, sub two's impossible. The mission, drop the world record to under two hours. Beat all odds, the naysayers who all say sub two is impossible. Jacob was ready. But to make this work, he'd have to call in the big guns. Big guns that were waiting for a moment like this. It was the community. The same community that was running to class with him while he was streaming throughout campus. They gravitated towards Jacob and rose to the occasion. It's a big community process. So there were four of us frantically routing this. Uh, we have glitch hunters. They were the ones finding the glitches and like, hey guys, we need to do this. We would tell the glitch hunters, we are trying to get from this location to this location. How do we best do that? And then they would come back to us like the next day. All right, you're gonna swap these items around and toss this many and you'll appear here. And then we would put that into the route. It's like, all right, now we need to get these items. How do we get these items? And then we would work together to do what the programming type people told us we needed to do. And then over that year, we just slowly found time saves and like this saves five minutes here, this saves five minutes there. Some things were bigger than others, maybe a 10 minute time save here and there. There's a bunch of memes with catch them all, but there's always the one where it's like, 
Congrats on your new catch them all record. Can't wait till next week when there's a 10 minute time save and then you have to come back again because we just constantly find like something and then do the run and get like a new time. Then we found this huge glitch. It saved 40 minutes. And this 40 minute time save came out and I got like a 224. And then it was a pretty good run too for like when that glitch had come out. And I spent the next maybe a month not even running the game, just purely routing it, purely do this here. This is the best thing to do. Go here first, then do this. All the components, I can even send you my notes. They are, I think, 130 pages long. Oh my in, God. In the Google Doc. Yeah, they're unbelievable. I had every single Pokemon listed, how to get them. They're everywhere they're located, what percentage they are in those locations. This Google Doc maps out every single detail Jacob needed to prepare for his run. It includes details like, name yourself one character name, name the rival RRRRMNZX, walk to the fighting dojo and fight the first trainer, lose on purpose. Buy one Great Ball, 98 Super Repels, 83 Antidotes, 94 Awakenings. Immediately open your menu and get on the bicycle that is one slot above your cursor. Then bike over to this one tile. When explaining a particularly difficult glitch called LG Fly, there's a huge note in here saying, you will crash your game. It's time to start the run. You can see Jacob starting the game normally picking Bulbasaur and fighting against the first infamous rival, now appropriately named RRRRMNZX. But then, things get crazy as Jacob starts taking advantage of the glitches in the game. You start seeing random characters fill the screen as Jacob messes around with the game's PC. Suddenly, you watch the main character floating in the air, out of frame, until a random level 7 Blastoise appears in battle. Jacob throws a Master Ball at this Blastoise, and all of a sudden, it turns into an Oddish. To which Jacob exclaims, yes, it worked. Then he immediately throws another Master Ball at the blank screen, and all of a sudden, Jacob has caught a Ditto. It's an insane run where Jacob catches a Pokemon every 30 to 50 seconds. It requires an insane amount of concentration and precise button presses. Jacob gets quiet for most of the run, only to explain things to chat when he catches a two second breather here and there. All of this in hopes of breaking the two hour wall. It's the end game. Jacob glitches his way into the famous Hall of Fame room, the final destination of the game. The timer on the bottom left corner of the screen shows 1 hour, 59 minutes, and 23 seconds. There are just 37 seconds left before the clock reaches a full 2 hours. Jacob mashes the A button as he flies through to glitch Professor Oak's congratulatory message. 30 seconds to go. The Hall of Fame registration for his Pokemon team starts. 20 seconds to go. Oh my god. Jacob realizes how close he is to the two hour mark. 15 seconds to go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Oh my the credits start to play and Jacob stops the timer. God. I didn't think I'd be able to do it. I got a one hour, 59 minute, 58 second time, and I was screaming. I was so happy when I got it. I'm completely shaking right now. I can't feel my arms at all. It's over. I like, I can't click on my mouse. I was like a, I think I was a junior in, in college and it was one in the morning. I woke up all my roommates. <laughs> I was, I was super happy about it. But through this happiness, Jacob makes sure to not forget to do one really important thing. I can't believe it. It's all over. Holy crap. All right. Who's getting rated? Always doing his part to give back to the community. 
even after achieving a new world record. Now that Jacob's satisfied with his times, he's back to focusing on spending time with his tribe. He's grown his community to over 26,000 followers. Jacob does his best to promote a fun and engaging stream, laughing at inside jokes with emotes and chat, doing silly speed runs like Michael Jackson percent, something you should definitely look into. And the community supports Jacob back through Twitch subscriptions, bits, and donations. It's a fun place to be. After the world record shattering shenanigans was over, Jacob decides to switch gears and return back to a familiar place. My final goal that I set for myself with that category was getting under a 155. I got like a 153. And that was the last time I held the record in Catch 'em All. And then the only other goal that I ever had for Catch 'em All was getting it into a Games Done Quick. Games Done Quick, GDQ, is a semi annual event where speedrunners of many different games come together to speedrun for charity. And if you remember from the beginning, it was a GDQ Pokemon Gold speedrun that Jacob, then Pure Snipes X, came across and launched his Pokemon speedrunning journey. It was Summer Games 2015. The Catch Em All run got accepted for Games Done Quick, and I was like, that's the last time I need to run this category, because I had accomplished everything I wanted with it. I got the sub two hours. I had held the record for like three years at that point, and then I got it into Games Done Quick, and it was a really good run. I got like under two hours at Games Done Quick, which is kind of crazy. Because I, I think my estimate was like 225 or something, because there's so much that can go wrong with it. So I had a good run there. And then after that, I retired from Catch 'em All, and eventually other people took my record. And today it's 137. It's 15 minutes faster than when I had stopped playing it, just because, again, people are constantly finding new things and improving it. Even though Jacob doesn't run Catch 'em All rigorously any longer, He's still frequent at GDQ. He's often commentating on other speedrunners' attempts during the charity runs, like for Kizaron, another prominent speedrunner in the community. We, we always joke, put me and Keys in a room and we can sell out for charity like way easy, like <laughs> between the two of us. And that was Keys running. But I also did a speedrun during his speedrun because... <laughs> we, we whipped out our Game Boys on the couch. Before the run, we'll like... We kind of do like a little brainstorming session in a way. So Keys will just do the run and we'll come up with talking points here and there. That's usually what we do like before a run. Make sure we cover this, make sure we cover that. It's not like as serious for like the Pokemon runs because they're like easy and we can just goof off the whole time. And a lot of us are just good friends. Like me and Keys are obviously good friends. I think Pokeye was on the couch. Pokeye is a good friend of ours. And then Devamsu as well. Devamsu and I go way back. He's actually one of the people I was talking about earlier. He was like, my biggest competition with Catch 'em All for like a year. So me and him go like way back. So we're just all good friends and just goofing off watching Kizaron struggle through Crystal and the, and the marathon as he does. So we just have a good time. And yeah, like in our in our brainstorming session, we'll just come up with, all right, this rocket section is super boring. What do we want to do? All right, how long is it? 20 minutes? What can we do in 20 minutes? Pokemon Red NSC is like a 20 minute run. What if we all just whipped out the Game Boy and played Pokemon Red? Oh, that's hilarious. And then we were talking about like, should we just like, like, what should we commentate? Should we commentate like Pokemon Red or Crystal? Let's commentate Pokemon Red. That sounds hilarious. So we were just like, all right, we're all gonna whip out Game Boys. We just, we just come up. Ever since watching that one GDQ speed run all those years ago, looks like Pure Snipes X has found his spot in the community. Like I said earlier, Jacob is a real-life, actual Pokemon master, in my eyes at least. His profession right now is to catch Pokemon all day. So when I got the chance to talk with him, I set aside time to learn the ropes. If I wanted to be a successful speedrunner and be like him, what should I do? If you're like going for the world record, you're going to, you're going to need to practice. I think a lot of people in speedrunning just like grind runs and i don't think that's always the best thing to do mm -hmm. 
Uh, I think it's good to sit down and focus on even just individual segments. A good example of that was I'm learning Red Glitchless right now because the Red Glitchless tournament's happening. So I've been watching more people do like Red Glitchless streams. And I feel like the most value I've seen people getting was I watched another runner, Huang Bro. He was running like specific segments and they're not segments that I would have expected people to be practicing. He was practicing like the Sabrina segment of red blue for 20 minutes. And it, it was weird seeing somebody practice the segment that I, like to me, it's always just been you just dig out of the gym and bike to the other one. Like, why would you ever practice that? But the people who are like at the top end of like runs will like sit down and practice these segments. Yeah. Deliver um, practicing. Yeah. So like practice, like at least at the top end is like a really big deal. And I think even early on, I think practicing like the hard things like over and over until you get good at them is really important when you're starting out. And you can always stream your practice too. people probably won't be as entertained. You won't get as many viewers, but at the end of the day, people are there for you. So you'll still have like your loyal fan base and like friends and whatnot who will stick around, even though you've been walking through Mount Moon for three hours, pressing the A button here and there. <laughs> Jacob gave me a lot more advice, like how to stand out from other streamers and who I should pay attention to in the community. And Jacob left me with one other practical bit of advice that's pretty applicable to anyone starting from zero like I was. So my biggest advice to new streamers is a lot of new streamers will look at their favorite streamers and how they stream. And I think that's not always the best way to go about it, because for me, I talk with my chat a lot and you're not going to be able to do that as a, a zero viewer streamer. You have to get people engaged with the stream. So a good way starting out is treat every run as if people are watching. So you might know that there's no viewers, but if you're just sitting there like playing your game, like like nobody's going to be entertained, nobody's going to want to talk to you, stuff like that. But if the whole time you're like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and try and I don't know, I'm going to do this here and whatnot. People will be more entertained than they may ask, oh, what do you think about this? Or like, why are you doing that? Expect to not have people talking. I didn't have my first message in chat until like my 10th stream. I, I literally streamed Zero people had ever seen me stream until stream like 10. And then finally somebody, it was like, I love cows or something. I, I totally forget their username. It was something about cows. Uh, they finally like typed their first message in chat and then I could like at least talk to somebody while I'm, <laughs> while I'm playing Pokemon. So yeah, definitely uh, don't expect an audience when you start out and be entertaining. Even if it's like a blank void of like nothingness, just be entertaining toward it and people will show up. And people will show up. Like the ones who hopped onto Jacob's stream back when he duct taped his microphone to his bed frame. People grow into crowds and crowds into communities. Like the community that stormed DC that one summer. If I had known before, I might have searched for that missing camaraderie in communities like these, instead of staring at a hotel ceiling that night. A couple weeks after I spoke with Jacob, I wanted to see what this community was up to, so I hopped onto Jacob's stream. Jacob's playing Pokemon Blue still, but a different category this time. I don't make my presence known. Not like it mattered since there were over 2,000 people watching him anyway. It's the end of the stream, and Jacob is reviewing his results of his run. His chat is filled with people saying GG and spamming emotes. Someone even calls Shen the God Gamer. Jacob announces that he's about to start a raid, and I freeze. I'm not sure if I'm ready to check out another speedrunner's stream just yet. The people in chat start going wild, like thrill seekers strapped into a roller coaster, waiting in anticipation for the ride to start. Jacob finds a target for the raid, another speedrunner who's just starting out with only a few people watching them. And before I could react, Jacob initiates the raid. Everyone in chat myself included, get caught in the funnel. And we reappear to meet a new streamer. 
and expand the community. Episode 2, Catch em Together. This is Life in Games, the show where I share the journeys of amazing people who have found their own homes in gaming. And maybe one day, both you and I can do it too. This episode was produced and edited by me, Andy Reinhold. Thank you, Jacob, for sharing your story. Special thanks to my wife for putting my wet laundry into the dryer for me because my back hurt. If you want to hear more from Jacob, we talk just tactics in our next episode, where Jacob gives me much more advice on how to make it into the gaming industry as a Twitch streamer and speedrunner. That's coming up next week on whatever platform you're listening on. And in our next story, I get in touch with my inner artist. That's coming up right here in two weeks. Follow Jacob on his Twitch channel, shenanigans underscore, or on Twitter at shenanigans smash. And if you like the show, please follow us here and give us a rating or a like on whichever platform you're listening on. You can also follow the show on Twitter to stay up to date with the latest announcements at Shiba Break, because everyone deserves a break with a Shiba. Thanks for listening. See you soon.